my goal is to help buyers understand the market in 2023. It's really aggressive. The last offer I put in is one of 19 offers and we lost. We knew exactly what we wanted to buy. We knew exactly how much we were going to put down. We knew the finances before going in. And if we didn't know that on day one, you just wasted the seller's time. You wasted the buyer's time. You wasted your own time and everyone's all pissed off. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My name is Elliot. And in this episode, we will be giving home buyers tips on how to buy a house in 2023. Now I'm not going to go ahead and dive in directly into the entire home buying process. But something that I've noticed, what I've been doing is consulting a lot of my home buyers, especially first timers, even people that have bought, you know, two, three, four houses on the changes in the market within the year 2023. Um, normally, you know, if anybody follows me on social media, you guys know that a lot of my videos are scripted. They're down to the T. And um, I thought I'd change it up a little bit, do a little podcast style um, I will be doing some editing, so I'm not wasting your time. There will be a lot of random gaps in between, but um, yeah, this is going to be raw. My personal thoughts did take some notes on five things, five things specifically that I wanted to cover, but um, yeah, I think this video would be perfect for anybody looking to maybe make that jump. We know a lot of people are out there saying there's no inventory out there right now, or they can't find a house or things are overpriced or, you know, there's a lot of random reasons or excuses, depending on how you look at it, of uh, the struggles of home buying in 2023. So I thought within this episode, we can go ahead and cover how to overcome some of those hurdles and better be prepared on uh, home buying and what you can do when the time is right for you. So again, whether you are a first time buyer, or you've bought multiple houses, you know, it could have been five, 10, 15 years ago, or pretty much pre COVID, a lot of things have changed. So I promise you, regardless of who you are, what you are, how old you are, whatever that looks like, you will find some value out of it. And I know there are a lot of real estate agents out there that also follow some of my content. I don't have the biggest following, but there are a few people that have commented my way saying they liked the contract video that I put out on YouTube, or even some of the social media reels where I give random people tips and they think, oh, hey, that's a great idea. So whether you're a realtor uh, or a first time buyer or whatever, you get the idea. Um, I promise you there's going to be some decent stuff for you. Uh, by all means, stick around. I'm sure there's going to be some things you maybe you never even thought of. And if you are a random, uh, if you're a random real estate agent watching this video, uh, please, I've got nothing to hide. I hope you are able to implement some of the strategies that I teach because uh, I do things a certain way. I think it is the best way to do it. I'm not saying it's the right way or the best way, but this is what's best for me, best for my clients. And uh, if you could learn something along the way, perfect. And uh, Hope to see you use those tactics on the other side of a deal one day. So with that said, one of the first things that I recommend to anybody, again, whether you are fresh out of college, looking to buy your first house or looking to downsize, moving from out of state, it doesn't matter who you are. The one thing that I would highly recommend is contemplate to yourself, talk, some, talk amongst your family and whoever it is that you're moving with and ask yourself the question, as simple as it sounds, do I need to move or do I just want to move? Now, I know that seems really stupid or it's just really broken down to its basic form, but something that I've come across with a lot of people that I've consulted is that they want to move, but in reality, they don't have to move. And what I mean by that is that if you have a job transfer, let's say you're moving from Florida, coming all the way here to Chicago or Milwaukee or wherever it is that I can service you, that is a necessity. You have to move. That is something that I don't know, your job cannot accommodate for virtual work and you physically have to move, right? Uh, sometimes I come across people that, let's just say they're college graduates and they just want to get their own privacy and uh, move out of mom and dad's house, right? They don't necessarily have to move, but they want to move. You know, maybe they want to go out on a date and, uh, you know, bring them home and, uh, you know, not like that, but, you know, bring them home, cook dinner instead of going out all the time as it gets expensive. And the privacy is nice. You know, I remember I lived at home for a while when I first met my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and uh, get a little hard, right? So sometimes people move out and they want the privacy. But something to ask yourself is, what are the pros and cons of going back and forth between, do I want that extra expense or can I just suck it up and save some money and utilize the cash in the long run? So that is definitely something that you guys want to contemplate. Uh, it's definitely the first thing that I would ask myself is, is it an absolute must that I need to move or can I just pawn that off and hold off and save some extra money? And the reason I bring this up is because we all know, it's no secret, the post-COVID market is just extremely aggressive. It is really seller heavy. Let me let me rephrase that. It favors sellers more than anything. So with that said, it's it's definitely something you want to contemplate. Now, if you're just selling, right, and you don't need to buy anything, you're going to come out on top. But in reality, if you've bought a house before and you need to sell in order to buy something else, it's going to be a wash, you'd think, depending, right? So to put things into perspective, 
my wife and I, we bought our current house back in 2019. Got a good deal for it. And um, COVID rolled around. We refinanced our house. And if we decided to move today and bought the exact same house, let's say we bought the house from ourselves. Yeah, we would end up doubling our mortgage because we've got an interest rate down the twos, uh, housing values have skyrocketed. So we would be trading in our $1,600 a month mortgage, which is a great deal in the Chicago suburbs, by the way, great deal, great area, great schools. And we'd probably be paying somewhere above three grand. Now, do we want to move? Yeah, we could use a bigger house. We, we don't need a bigger house, but you know, we work hard. We like nice things. And with that said, that's something that we would contemplate. What's the risk reward ratio of getting a higher mortgage? Now we've got a three bedroom house. We've got three toilets. You know, there's only two of us in there. We, we've got it pretty good. We've got an updated kitchen. We've got all these nice things. So from a personal perspective, do we need to move? No, we live in a, a nice town home, a little under 3000 square feet, two car garage. We have everything we need. Uh, but you know, sometimes we want our privacy. We want to not be able to sit outside and have our neighbors five feet away from us and just, again, not five feet, but you get the idea right there listening into our conversations. We just want the extra space. But after my wife and I talked about it, do we want that extra expense? No. So we're just sucking it up, saving more capital as we go. So when the right opportunity pops along, boom, go ahead and pull that trigger. Now, circling back to the person that's moving here from Florida, if you do need to move, then by all means, skip the rest of this part and just wait for the second, second tip, if you will. But um, one more thing that I'd like to stress, let's say you don't have a house to sell. You're a college graduate. You just moved. I'm sorry, you just, you just caught, oh my goodness, I can't even talk today. You just graduated college and you're thinking, man, got a great job. I want to move, want my own place. You got to ask yourself it, a couple things. Is it worth diving into that long-term expense, right? Which kind of leads me into my second point. And the second tip that I give for you is figure out what your life ambitions are. Now, I know this is going to start to sound real coach-like and things like that, but it is something true. And I'll, I'll relate it back to ourselves here. Let's say you just got a job right? For example, I've got a lot of friends that work for at and I used to work for at and I was in the cell phone industry for about 10 years before I started doing real estate. And the one thing that I remember about working for at and is that if you wanted to move up in the company, which they've got great benefits, they've got great pay, they, they have all these perks, which I didn't realize was that good until now. Um, I was too immature for the job at the time. But if you want to succeed in that company, you need to be able to move. You need to be portable, if a job opening lines up in a different state or a different city, you got to pack your stuff and go. So with that said, you know, you've got to factor in, okay, do I want to physically live here for the next 30 years or am I going to move in two years? Because if you're going to move in two years, you're not going to recoup all the costs that come with home buying. So I'm not going to dive into the full expenses of things, but the one thing I will tell you is on top of your down payment, especially in Illinois, you're going to spend about $8,500 just to, just to buy a house. And then when you sell your house two years later, you're not going to build that 8,500 in equity right away. So depending on how the math lines up, and it's going to be subjective towards who you are and what you're buying, you're probably not going to recoup your costs. So at that point, it might be worth to stay at home or even rent for a few years. Some people say that, you know, renting is horrible. Some people say renting is the worst thing in the world and you should go buy because you're not building equity. But the reality is, is that's a subjective thing and it depends on who you are and what you do. Like I said, if you need to move in two years, cool, renting is for you. But if you're locking yourself into a 30-year mortgage because you're going to stay there, yeah, build that equity. It only makes sense. Now, circling back to the ambitions and the goals perspective, let me give you a little personal perspective of the things that my wife and I contemplated when we bought the house that we currently live in. So we moved in 2019. We moved one town over. We went from a town home to another town home. We factored in a few things. We love to travel. We want to live light expense-wise, right? You probably, anybody that follows us on social media, you know we travel all the time. I'm going to Vegas here in about two weeks for my birthday. It's going to be a lot of fun. I've been there before. And we like to spend money on experiences. It is what it is. We like to go out to eat all the time. We like to travel all the time. We don't have any kids. So, you know, while our expenses are low, let's go ahead and go, ahead and go have some fun. But with that said, that's why we live in a townhome. I don't want to shovel snow in the middle of December three feet of snow. Not that we ever get three feet of snow, but it is possible. I don't want to do all that stuff. So we purchased a place that has homeowner associations who contract out um, snow shoveling and yard maintenance and all those things. 
Um, that was just the right lifestyle choice for us. Now, when we sold our other place, did we have an option to move back into our parents' house? Yeah, cool. We could have. It's not ideal. But I know if uh, we wanted to, we had the option to. Something that maybe some of you know, some of you don't know, is that uh, my wife and I right now, we own a salon right down the road from my office in Libertyville. It's a very successful salon. We got great partners. But um, we knew one of our life ambitions, especially for her, this was her dream. She wanted to start a salon, run her own show. And we weren't able to do that unless we were able to live small and save all that money because running a salon is expensive. It's, uh, I'm not going to get into the numbers because I didn't ask the partner's permissions, but um, use your imagination. We've got to buy the building or rent it out. That's an expense. We've got to buy the chairs, the mirrors, the products, the systems, all that stuff. So we knew we needed some sort of capital. So if we went off and just bought the most expensive house out there, odds are we wouldn't be in this exact situation that we are today. So those are things that you have to ask yourself too, is before you're buying a house, you know, how long are we going to live somewhere? And are there going to be life events that will dramatically change what I want to do? Now, nothing's going to be perfect at the end of the day. You have to understand that, right? Things happen, things change. It is what it is. But the more, something I always say all the time is control your controllables. So the more you can prepare and control up front, the better off you'll be. Which then leads me to my next point. Third tip that I would give you guys is what does your finances look like? And if I had to phrase it in the form of a tip is understand your finances. Going back to controlling the controllables, you control your finances. So with that said, you need to understand where your leverage is if you're going to buy a house. So understanding your finances would mean, are you paying cash? Do you need a loan, aka a mortgage? And you need to understand what that looks like. Now, just because you get a loan from someone, there's still going to be additional costs. You got to pay for a home inspection. Now, you don't have to, but I think you'd be an absolute idiot to buy a house without an inspection. Now, there are times where that might be applicable, right? But in a normal, uh, a normal market, if you will, uh, you might want to protect something that you're paying off over the duration of 30 years by knowing exactly what the hell you're buying. Um, you know, there's going to be some additional expenses. So whether you're buying the house by yourself or you've got a girlfriend, fiance, spouse, whatever, combine your finances if both of you guys are paying for it, you better understand exactly what yourself, what you're getting yourself into. So understand your finances, understand how much you want to spend. And going back, circling to my own personal experience, because I think you've heard that saying, experience is the best teacher, but I want to tweak that a bit and say, learn from other people's experiences. And that's the best teacher. Um, something that my wife and I did is that we knew when we bought our house in 2019, we opened the salon in 2021, went under contract for that commercial building in 2020 and started the whole process in 2020. We wanted to move. We moved and we went small. We put the bare minimum down on the house. We had capital to put 20% down if we wanted to, but the market didn't call for it. We didn't have to. The house that we bought was listed for nine months. They couldn't sell it. So we got ourselves a hell of a deal. Um, they were desperate to sell. And so we jumped on that, took advantage of it, um, put three and a half percent down. And the reason why is because we knew that we wanted to buy a salon. We needed that capital to put in towards, put towards a business venture. So going back to my last point, understanding what your life ambitions are, which also factors into your finances. So understanding your finances goes a big way. So we knew we wanted to put the bare minimum down. We knew we were getting a good price for it. And at some point we thought we could even rent this house out. Now, one thing that I will tell you is never buy a house thinking you're just going to rent it out. A lot of people get these ambitions of being landlords. They see things online, TikTok, Instagram, whatever, and say, oh yeah, I want to be a landlord and it's an asset, this, this, and that. We'll talk about that in a whole other video, but for now, a home is an expense. It's a liability. You're never going to get your money back on, you know, the furnace filters that you change out, your electrical bills and all that other expenses. So it is not an asset, no matter what anyone says. But sticking, on, sticking to the topic, uh, we knew exactly what we wanted to buy. We knew exactly how much we were going to put down. We knew the finances before going in to the house search. And if we didn't know that on day one, We'd see the house and then try to scramble everything together. And then once we're under contract, we might have had a, like an afterthought and think, oh, crap, we should have done this differently or we should have done that differently. So, again, I don't know what that looks like for you, but you as a buyer, figure that out. Have those conversations with the people that you know, the people that you love, people that you aspire to be and people that uh, who are mentors to you, whether it's a father figure or a mother figure. Or, it doesn't matter friend, people that are in a place that you are now, you know, or you want to be in the future. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but figure that out. It's not going to be perfect, but having that conversation up front 
is going to go a long way versus not having it at all. And if you're a real estate agent watching this, please tell your clients that because there are a lot of people that go home shopping first and then they figure out the numbers and then we just wasted everyone's time. You just wasted the seller's time. You wasted the buyer's time. You wasted your own time and everyone's all pissed off. So control the controllables and figure out your finances. Now, the fourth tip that I can give you guys, it's a little vague, but uh, take it with a grain of salt, figure out what it looks like for you is um, what's your plan? You got to figure out what your plan is. You got to figure out your timelines. Overall, you just don't go into the whole home buying process without some sort of plan. I know most people, when they contact me for, you know, showings or consultation or whatever the case may be, they scroll through Zillow, you know, they start looking at houses and they talk to their spouse or whoever the case that they live with and say, hey, let's, let's move. This house is gorgeous. This house is this, this house is that. And then by the time they figure out all the intangibles that they need to understand, the house is gone. 2023, houses don't sit on the market longer than 48 hours. And if they do, it's because there's a bidding war or, you know, there's an external factor or whatever. But I guarantee you, most houses on the market, when it's right, turnkey ready, ready to go, move-in ready, forget cosmetics. Those are all subjective. Um, yeah, people will get an offer within one day. So again, control the controllables and figure out what your plan is. So for example, um, just throwing a random person into the mix here, it's July right now, a little after the 4th of July. I don't remember the date. I think it's the 7th. It's July 7th right now, right? Rewind back to spring break. Let's just say mid-March. Let's say you're a family with kids in elementary school, right? You know your average real estate transaction could take anywhere between 30 to 45 days. Now, what if the people you're buying a home from requires them to sell your home or their home in order to buy another home? And the people they're buying from requires the same thing. They're called home sale contingencies. So as boring as this stuff sounds, your home purchase that should have taken 30 days could take 90 days. And what if you wanted to move beginning of summer, have your kids get their rooms squared away, ready to go, and just enjoy your summer. But because of poor planning, next thing you know, you could potentially be moving boxes in two days before the kids start school. You got nothing going on. You don't know where their backpacks are. You got the kitchen's not done. You know, their desks aren't done in their bedrooms. They have no place to study. You get the idea. So not everything's going to be perfect, but again, you need to figure out what that plan is. Another thing, I'm going to talk to real estate agents right now. When I say come up with a plan, that is something that I factor in in the consultation process with my clients. You know, um, if you don't have a plan going in, you're not going to know exactly how to pull the trigger. A uh, quick tip, again, for like a side tip within a tip, something that I urge every person buying a house to is figure out a plan. This is what my offer is going to look like. This is the most amount of money we want to spend on a month. This is how much we're willing to go over asking price, right? If someone says, hey, listen, I want to buy a house for $300,000 and you offer them like three thirty, dollars good luck. You have to have a plan saying, hey, for example, if the bank doesn't give me a loan for three thirty, dollars what are you going to do, right? Sometimes some people pay the difference. Some people say, well, screw that. I don't want to overpay for a house. Well, without a plan and having that conversation, you're screwed. You're not going to get what you want. You're going to feel so negative about the entire situation that's happening right now. And this is why I'm making this video. This podcast is exactly that. Buyers, understand, if you don't have a plan and you just think it's going to be a perfect world, the last house that I just threw an offer in last week had 19 offers on it, and we didn't get it for various reasons, which for privacy purposes, I'm not going to share with you. But just think about it, 19 offers, and we had a plan going in. I never show houses without a plan. All my clients respect that, and we still lost. Now, maybe it was uh, financing. Someone bought it cash. Maybe someone waived an inspection. I don't know. It could be a number of things, but, well, I do know the answer, but I'm not going to share that with you. But the point is, is that you have to have a plan. So agents, again, I've been on the list side where there is no plan from buyers. They don't even have the contract filled out properly because they never even instructed their clients on how to fill those out. They never pre-planned and controlled the controllables. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. You've got to control those things and they just don't know what the fuck they're doing. So again, if you don't, have a plan going in. You're either going to overpay for a house, overlook a contingency, overlook an inspection. By the time you move in, you figure out what's going wrong. You've realized it's too late. And then it's, oh my God, real estate, home buying is a horrible experience. I hate it. Realtors suck. Just like mechanics, they're always ripping people off. Uh, doctors, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's case by case. And it's who you're working with. And you got to figure all this out on day one or before day one starts. The Day one is home searching. So that kind of transitions me into my next point. And the fifth tip that I want to give you is pick the perfect team. Now, the perfect team is completely subjective. You know, I've had people not work with me because they don't like my style. 
They don't want to work with me because I have specific demands and expectations for my clients. To put a little backstory on that, I don't, I do business a certain way. It's a two-way street. If someone is good with my process and they trust me with it, I'd be more than happy to work with them. But if we're not a good fit, it's not fair for eight other clients that I have going on right now to respect that. And then I cater and bend over backwards for someone else. It just makes a terrible flow. So, you know, for that reason, it, it's a two-way street and um, we're not a perfect fit. But something that I will say is that um, your team, let me emphasize on that. Let's say you're paying a house with cash, right? I've done cash transactions before, but most of you, I'm assuming, require some form of financing, right? So, if you're just paying cash, all you need in Illinois side, you don't need an attorney, but I highly recommend an attorney. I'm licensed in Wisconsin. We don't use too many attorneys, but I still always recommend an attorney. So your attorney works for you and you get your agent showing your houses, writing contracts. We work for you. Now, if you need uh, financing, like a loan or whatever the case may be, now you need a mortgage lender, right? If you want the contingencies of inspection, now you also have a home inspector on your team. And there's all these other people getting thrown into the mix, right? The more people more things can go wrong. One thing that I like to say is too many chefs in the kitchen, recipe for disaster. Now, something that I preach all the time is that the agent, the attorney, the inspector, everyone, doesn't matter. We work for you. Without you, none of this is possible, right? You don't work for us. So something that I preach as a real estate agent, a little tip for the other real estate agents, and uh, if you're interested, you'll hear all of this on The Growing Agent. It's a course that we have online. It's great. Check it out. Put a link in the description in the test. Something that I always preach to all my clients and our students is that you need to understand that we work for the client, right? So to give you a better example, I don't show homes before 12 p.m. And a lot of people think that's weird, but my clientele works nine to five, most of them. So they get off work. I got a showing tonight at eight o'clock and uh, 8 p.m. And I think it's uh, 644. So if I can't show houses when you need me, we're not a good fit and that's okay, right? Same with loan officers. If they work at a bank, which never go to a bank for a loan, please. There are various reasons why. I'm not saying never, but it's not something that I'm a fan of. So I'll tell you that in another video, another episode. But um, let's say, for example, you work nine to five, Monday through Friday. Banks are open nine to five, Monday through Friday. You need to get a hold of your loan officer. Good luck. You and I, we're on the same page. We're looking at houses at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. You want me to write an offer. I'll be up till nine, 10 o'clock at night drafting that offer. I need to get a hold of the loan officer. And unfortunately, I can't get a hold of them because the phone number is on their desk on a landline. And what if it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday? And the agents say, hey, listen, we're making a decision by Sunday because my client, the seller, needs to go to work on Monday. Now that loan officer just did you a disservice. So that person is not part of the perfect team that you require. So attorneys, a little different. Or an attorney that I recommend, Rebecca McNeil, she's fantastic. Um, luckily I have a great relationship with her business relationship and, uh, I ever sell, God forbid I ever need anything from one of my clients. She goes, yeah, please just text me. Like we're close enough that I respect that. That's cool. Whenever you need something, I'm there. Same with my loan officer, Sly Marinka, great guy right now, cross country mortgage, um, him and his team work wonders. And I'll only recommend people that I've personally used. I know there are a lot of real estate agents out there that, make professional recommendations and never used them a day in their life. I can vouch for the experience that I have with all my vendors. So if you know no one in the process, but you trust one person, and this is generally the case with most of my clientele, they trust me and they say, hey, Laliot, like I've got you based off of a, um, an experience we had in open house. I got a great feel for you or uh, you were recommended by so-and-so. You know, they say high things. So trust my process and feel them out. If you don't like the process, go with someone else and go with a whole new team. But where issues arise is your uncle is a loan officer for such and such company out of state, or you go with a company, let's just say Rocket Mortgage. Hypothetically, they're based out of Detroit. Their office is closed at four. At least this was the experience that I had. And um, four o'clock central time is what I'm getting at because we're in the Chicago area and kind of did us a disservice. So I like using people that are tangible, local. I can shake their hand. So yeah, make sure you build the perfect team based off the necessities that you require and you're well off. So again, to recap, this is kind of a broad podcast, if you will, I'm just keeping it raw, trying to edit it down. So you just get the best information that you need. If you're a buyer or an agent watching this, please take these tips to heart. Um, maybe I'll do a second podcast. And what I want to do at some point is get Sly on the show. He's great. Um, does really well. And uh, he represents a lot of real estate agents um, and their clients. 
Uh, Rebecca, great attorney. She's great. Eric Yost, uh, one of my inspectors. I'll be honest, I've never used him personally, but after, you know, seeing him, you know, he was recommended my way and I told a client, hey, listen, this, this guy's great. I know he works with a lot of agents in my office. I've never used him personally, but I hear great things and they give him a shot and he's fantastic. I would use that guy any day of the week. Next time I buy a house, he's my go-to guy. Um, have him on the show. That'd be great. But overall, this is episode one. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, my goal is to just help buyers understand the market in 2023. It's really aggressive. So if I had to leave you with a couple last second tips is that uh, if you're a buyer in 2023, if the listing agent asks for $300,000 and you offer them $300,000 and $100, you better have that $100 to pay the difference. And that's not always the case, but the reality is, like I told you earlier in this episode, the last offer I put in is one of 19 offers and we lost, right? So if you're going against 19 other people and if an agent knows they can get more than whatever that listing price is, they would have just listed it at that price. So if you're going to make an offer above that list price, you better have a plan or some sort of a solution to the potential problem of, oh, hey, my bank says that the appraisal or the appraiser that came out said the house wasn't worth that much. You got to figure out what you're going to do. So that's one thing. You also need to factor in as many contingencies. Do you need to sell a house in order to buy a house? You better factor that in figure out what the plan is, figure out what your agent's plan is, figure out what your financial plan is. You got to figure out all the logistics because there's a lot going on, right? And three, trust the guidance of your agent, right? Your agent should be giving you before you look at the houses, before you go on your first showing, they better explain in writing, or I'm sorry, in detail, every bit of writing on those contracts and every attachment that goes with it, every other form that goes with it. If they can't understand it for themselves and explain it to you in a fact or in a way that you can understand, you better find somebody else because the last thing you want to do is go in, sign a piece of paper that you don't understand. And then you just locked yourself in and you lose your security, uh, not your security deposit. You lose your earnest money. You lose your, uh, in other states, they have something called a non-refundable deposit. You better know what you're doing before going into this whole thing. So if i uh, just going to throw myself out there, if you or anyone you know is looking to buy, sell real estate, by all means, feel free to give me a call, reach out in the DMs, whatever it is, be more than happy to help. And uh, yeah, see you on the next show.